Hey, in the early 2000s, when I first met James Lowry, I knew I was meeting greatness, not only in the sense of a person renowned for his wisdom and experience, but meeting James Lowry was life changing for me. And it was in this encounter that I knew I was going to learn a lot and I was also going to change a lot. Well, in his new book, Change Agent, Professor Lowry, as I respectfully and lovingly refer to him, shares as many of the truths and lessons that he ever did with me, with the reader. And I valued him over the years for his ability to turn his real life experiences into lessons for everybody. His book is data rich for the scientists who are gonna read it, and it's also problem solving for the practitioners. But here's the thing, his approach aging that I just had to call him up and say, hey, look, friend, let's have a conversation. I love talking with him. We've talked over many times about so many things. And one of the things that mattered a whole lot to me as our relationship progressed is that Professor Lowry was that person who always came to me in this direct way. Yeah, he was a teacher. Yeah, he was a friend. But in many ways, he was that visionary that I needed when I couldn't be it for myself. So I'm really excited to talk with him today. Joining us right now is one of America's most successful female entrepreneurs. Special guest speaker today, the first African-American woman to own a billion dollar company. Her name is Janice Bryant Howroyd. She's the founder and CEO of Act One is one of the largest staffing companies in the United States. She's now ranked by Forbes as second wealthiest self-made African-American woman in America behind only Ms. Oprah Winfrey. She spent almost 40 years helping others find work. Janice, great to have you on the show. Wonderful to be Thank here. Thank you so much Wonderful. for joining us. Janice, welcome to the program. Janice, what about your Wow, so I'm really excited about this conversation because, well, for a lot of reasons, but primarily your new book out is like, it has to be the required reading for anybody who, A, wants to understand where we are in the world today and post Black Lives Matter, let's just be honest, Professor Lowry, you were there long ago. I mean, you were preaching and teaching the stuff and candidly, Although there's a lot left to be done, a lot that was done was done because of the work you've been achieving. So I've got so much I want to talk about. But first, just tell us, why did you feel right now was the time to write this book? You've had so many opportunities and requests to do this book. Why now? I think that was the most important issue. I mean, most, you know, you, you see me in the classroom. So I've been in the classroom. I had my program at Kellogg since 1996. I had a special course at Kellogg for the undergraduates and the graduate program. I go around the country for ELC. But people kept saying, you got to write a book because your life is so interesting. I mean, and for somebody to understand you and what you've done, you should tell the whole story. And so I felt because I've been so blessed coming out of the South Side of Chicago and being with the first Black at McKinsey and being the you know, first senior vice president at BCG, but still being very proud of being a black man trying to affect change, everybody should know the journey. Everybody should know who are the people that influenced me. They should know the impact of the civil rights movement had on me. I, I say it in the book, I am affirmative action child. If it hadn't have been for the affirmative action, I probably wouldn't have gotten the opportunities I got in, in the colleges and universities. So I owe it back to those people who helped me. And I always felt a responsibility to share with the next generation or generations so that they could learn from my, what I did well, some of the mistakes I made, but even more importantly, how do you function in a very, very complex US you know, environment, economics, and still be proud of yourself and be successful. So that was my goal. The book was published before COVID. It was published just like your book was pushed before COVID and before George Floyd. So it just came out at the right time so that people were saying now, oh, Jim, you know, you or Professor Larry or whomever, you know, you've been there before. Tell us what we have to do Monday. 
Well, between me and you, Janice, I've been saying what we had to do Monday, as you say, for 30 years. Nobody was listening. The good news, I guess they're listening now to this guy who's been out there preaching and talking and trying to energize people for change for, well, for 40 I, years. I, I want to dig into that a little bit because um, there's just so much to share, so much for you to teach. I think the best way to do that is even before we jump into the book, let's jump into life because yeah. you talk in your book handily about your parents' experience and what got them to Chicago. And I think that's really important for people to understand because the people who very much framed who you were and how you approached the world had a lot of stuff that they had to overcome to offer you what some might say were better opportunities than others, but still was not a level playing ground. Let's talk about your parents. Can we go back and talk about Absolutely. that before you even happen? Absolutely. Uh, my father was from Memphis, Tennessee, you know, didn't have much money. And he was kind of the elder. The, the father wasn't in the house. So my father had to be, you know, the big brother for his brothers and sisters. And when he moved to Chicago, he had to be the head of the family, you know, see so before he married my mother, because he had to take care of his mother, his brother and his three sisters. And then my mother was originally from Hollandale, Mississippi. And uh, it was a different kind of arrangement because back in the South, my grandmother was somebody I always loved and had lived with her for a short period of time. She was the one who everybody had uh, Emma Jane Watson. Mm -hmm. She was, everybody in those communities had Emma Jane Watson. She had different lotions and salves for people's illnesses. She went around, she, she had chickens that she would sell. And she was the spiritual leader, very religious, and, and kind of everybody came to her. And my grandfather was a carpenter. Wait a minute, wait a minute. So what grandma was doing, lots of people are paying a lot of money for now. And she was a oh, absolutely. From a very natural estate. I want to be really clear because you know, I grew up in the South too. When those folks were mixing that stuff up, they were mixing it up from a very herbal perspective that, Absolutely. I mean, I think the Queen of England today is a fan of much of this medicine, natural medicine, yes? That's right. And, and it came from Africa. And we, I mean, we can go into that as well. And my father, my grandfather was a carpenter, a very skilled carpenter. And he, he, he trained his two sons to be carpenters. And that was very important to have an income. And unfortunately, he was so good that, and he was very handsome. He was a very handsome man. I have photographs of him. Oh, that very, reminds me of your family with the men folk. Go on. <laughs> but, <laughs> so he, and then somebody accused him of flirting with a white woman. Oh, God. And, and he alleged that that never happened, just like in Tulsa, it never happened. And we could go all around the country in all these different instances, Emmett Till, swear, that did not happen. And so, but we had no other choice. So they, uh, they had no other choice. So they, in 24 hours, they got him on the train to go to Chicago to escape the KKK, to escape oh election. Professor Lowry, let me just tell you why you're giving me such chills. Because I don't know if any of our audience, or even if you are aware of what happened in Wilmington, North Carolina in 1898, but that exact same thing happened that you're describing now of men in the night running for their lives and their family because of being accused of having had attention or behavior with a white woman, black men. This is, Oh, anyway, yeah, we got a lot to talk about. We'll lean in on your family right now, but we've got so much to talk about. We got so much stuff, but yeah, we always do. I love you so much. But here, I mean, so what happened? He had to leave. And then I say it in the book. I, I mean, I didn't say it to be funny or anything like that. I said, because he was so handsome. I just wonder if somebody made a play for him and he denied her aggressiveness and to her her embarrassment, she then made a lie up that changed my life and changed my mother's lives. So he had to go to Chicago. 
and he had a skill so he could get jobs. But my, my, my grand uncle, my two uncles stayed in Chicago with him with the promise that they would bring my mother and her two sisters back to Chicago when they were established. And that's what they did. The interesting thing is that, you know, we were not rich, but they had a farm and they were able to send my mother and her sister to Mary Home Seminary, which is a little private school for black people. And my aunt, the eldest, was able to go to college. And she went to, you know, uh, she went to a black college and learned cosmetology. So once again, Janet, what happened, she had all these trademarks. It's once she, she started something called Apex Beauty School. So it was, it was, they were all over the country. So she got Atlanta and she had all these formulas. I didn't know what to do. She gave me the formulas. If I had known better, I could have started Johnson. Pro but I didn't know what I was doing. You now, now you're leaning in very closely on one of my sheroes, Madam C.J. Walker. So oh, right. I, I, I'm, I mean, I'm just wrapped. This I did not know before. And I thought I knew a lot about you. Oh, no. And so my, my aunt was, was the first entrepreneur in the family. Because she was training all, just like, that's why that movie, I just, it was such a close thing for me, because that's what my aunt did. She would bring in these black women from, and black girls all over the South, buying homes for them to stay in, where she gave them a course in cosmetology. And then she would do hair on the side. She did Mrs. King's hair. You know, the Papa King's wife's hair on Apex at Auburn Avenue in Atlanta. Wow. That was my, she was wonderful. She would come to Chicago with these big hats and she would have presents for us. And she was part of my inspiration of being an entrepreneur because I saw what my aunt Alice did with these schools of beauty culture and, and really educating young people and gave them livelihoods. So that was my family. And then they, you know, you know we had Chicago and if, if anybody's ever uh, looked at the movie called The Thirteenth, you know, it's a very powerful book. And we always thought the migration, you know, to the North was because of economics. Well, it was, but there was also escaping lynchings. Right. It, it, was, it was a combination of both. And so my parents were part of that big migration to Chicago, you know, trying to make the most of it. So my uncles became uh, carpenters for the post office and uh, the other one became a carpenter on the railroad. And my mother, uh, stay at home for a while, then we wanted to have two incomes. And so she went into the post office with my father. And as you know, the post office was like the black middle class. I was going to say, if you got a job in the post office, you were oh, moving on up. That's it, moving on up. And when you think of many of the people in my generation, like Herbie Hancock, I could give names after names, Don Stewart, who was the president of Spelman, all the, our parents worked in the post office. I mean, that was the way in which we, and it was very clear, they had uh, retirement homes, they had health, and they had a steady income. And many well, of the now people, we hear in a little bit that the post office may not continue, but it has a legacy of a lot, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. And I think about even the people now, I mean, now we're going to come to 2020, and I think about the history that, that the post office played. And when they started talking about privatization, because you know me, who's going to be privatized in those jobs? So I, you know, I know what the percentage of people in the post office around this country, what percentage are black and brown. I don't know if we privatize postal services, we will have the same percentages. Well, we're going to put a pin in it for now. We don't like to talk about, we're still on that journey with you. So you've not been born yet. Okay. All right. Let's, okay. Let's let tell us as your book so eloquently and I must say poignantly does, um, what was going on when you hit the stage? Nineteen thirty nine. Thirteen. I'm telling you, Chicago then and it still is, but then was a very segregated community. You know, there were only a couple of places that we could live in, and of course we were on top of each other. And, and that was a big thing. So I, with my father, my mother, we were in with the other brothers and aunts. And that was a big thing to get a rental place where we could have our own apartment. It was only a one bedroom apartment, but it was ours. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was my mother, my father, my brother. 
And so when you were thinking about that, you had race riots. There were certain places in Chicago, you know, we still have problems now. You could not walk in and if you didn't fear for your life. We're not talking about getting beat up. You, you could not fear. You had fear for your life. So there were certain, you know, parts of Chicago was like that. In getting into unions, we couldn't get into unions. We we had to do the best we could, but we survived. I mean, black people are very strong people, and we survived. And we had an uncle who made a lot of money. He was a waiter at the oh, at, at the Conrad Hilton Hotel, and he he was a very good waiter, and he got tips. And because he got tips, he was probably the wealthiest guy in, in our immediate. You know, community because and it was the good. Style of the French. I remember my first trip to France and experiencing a waiter in a restaurant, and that waiter had such elegance and such care. Absolutely. It was able to teach me so much, not just about the menu, but about the stories and foods and people associated with that restaurant. And I gave such a, an incredible tip. And after I left, um, one of my friends commented, Oh, you know, you've now had the true French experience because the waiters are sought after here. You, mm -hmm. They don't bow to your ask, you bow to their knowledge. And I thought, wow. And I'm hearing the same thing going on with, with your family, Professor. Oh, yeah. It definitely, <laughs> I mean, you, and just think about that. Who, who, who were the people who were making money back in those days that we were very proud of? You had to deal with the people on the railroad. Those guys and those red hats on the railroads with those nothing. Georges, those Georges. Think about it. Mm -hmm. they, they, they were one. They, they had such style, just like you're talking about the Prince. The same style. They, when people got on that train, they felt special because of those talents of those people in the railroad. Mm -hmm. The same thing when you go to the airport. You know, when you had those people take your luggage, it was a different, different era. And people made the made the best of it, and even in the food. What was your Minutes. community like? What do you remember smelling and seeing and tasting as a kid? Fried chicken. My, <laughs> I my, know my, that's your favorite food. <laughs> oh, and they said my brother and I would get tired of it because every every Sunday, and this is part of my life too, the good part, you know, every Sunday my mother would fry chicken. She fried five chickens. You hear me? For, for the family and for the neighbors and everybody would come by the house and we just had fun. We would go in the park, my brother and I would, were athletes, we played and then we'd come back and just hang out with our aunts and uncles. And that was right at the beginning of television. I'm really giving my age away. So I mean, in the early Don't part worry of about it. Look, I didn't get a television in our house until I was about 10 years old and I never <laughs> stepped foot in a car until I was 12. So. Okay. It's not always an indication of the year. Sometimes it's the economics combined. It is the economics, you know. <laughs> don't, people don't know about the good things like having uh, color television. It, we, the early days was black television. It, you couldn't get any reception. You had to And then later you got that little film and you put it across and everything looked red. And the red. color, right. That was the early days. That's, we had, that's how we had color, you know. And everybody had to hold, remember the antenna? Because it would go all right, you know. We were, we were adjusting and then watching Ed Sullivan. And, and I say in my book, you know, when Nat King Cole was one of the first to oh appear on, on the Ed Sullivan show, that was so historic. It was so historic having in there. And the Nicholas brothers dancing. What and kind we had, of noises? What kind of noises were going on in your house and in your community? What did you hear? You know, I, we had, it really takes me back, but it, there was a lot of laughter. People enjoyed each other. They enjoyed their families. When you went out to the park and you see pic picnic baskets and people were playing, there was a lot of joy in, in, in our lifetime, you know? And, and we didn't, we never knew we weren't middle class because we weren't. But it was, it was a pride that you had. And I think the most important thing as you've often articulated, the support that we got from our parents to make it better for us and so that we could be elevated to another level in our society and, and do well. And the, the sacrifices they made, and even the other day, 
you kind of reinforced it when you said, you know, you did it because that's what you should do. And it's not a, you know, a quid pro quo. Yeah, you we were brought up to do well and do good at the same time. At the same time. And it wasn't just, maybe that was part of the times. And, you know, and, and I often make jokes about, you know, back when Jet was first started, even before Jet, we had the Pittsburgh Courier and, and, and the Defender, and it would be the first this, Hazel Scott, the first person that did this, Adam Clayton Powell, this. So we had history and we took pride. Now, now, now Professor Tony, because we have such a young audience, I want to make sure that you share with them what these uh, editorials, what these magazines are, so that they can go Google because they won't have a memory experience to this. So let them know the importance of these uh, magazines. And, 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 you know, for me, I remember getting Sepia magazine in our oh, home, yes. Jet and Ebony. And those were the only places that I would see Blacks who were doing things that I believed only whites could do absent those articles. That's where we found out about ourselves. So please, can you can you just go back and oh, absolutely. List, those, list those with a little bit more information for our listeners? Yeah, I think it's very important for people to understand the power, the significance of the black newspapers first, because especially the Chicago Defender and the Pittsburgh Courier. And it was so powerful when you started talking about the South when, when the, the jobs were, not only did we talk about the great things that were happening in our community and the great stars and the great athletes and the great entertainers, those newspapers presented in such beautiful way. But they also told us about the lynchings and the terrible things that were still occurring in the South and parts of the North, about the race riots and how people got killed, et cetera, et cetera. But what the most important thing the Chicago Defender did, and they would bring them up on the railroad. They would bring them up from Chicago. It was originally from Chicago. It is Chicago newspaper, still is. They would bring them up and they'd bring them in the South. It was just like they had to sneak them into these cities. Because- right, right. I remember that very well. They had to sneak them in. And, yeah. and what people didn't realize, because they were offering jobs and opportunities in the North, and we know, because you're from the South, you could probably write the book on this, how much the economy of the South and even the country, you know, in the 21st, 19th century, depended on Black labor, depended on Blacks working in the field. So there the even statistics, there were statistics I shared recently, maybe a couple of weeks ago, um, that, that, that validated that Black backs accounted for one third of the nation's total wealth. GMP. And the number got closer to over 40% when you move from direct to indirect. Right. So over half by 1900 of the nation's wealth then occurred because of slavery or the legacy thereof. Absolutely. That is huge. Well, just deal with cotton. If you talk about a commodity, think about cotton. And that wasn't just Southern. It was Northern economics as well. The Absolutely. financiers all depended on that labor as well, because we all know Lincoln got forced to glory. That's right. It, 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 exactly. I mean, when we think about cotton, we think about plantations and wealth that was created for the plantation owners. But we lose sight of the fact what a tremendous advantage as a nation we had in cotton being a product or a commodity going around the world. So that was part of the foreign exchange in Europe. That created the big banking and financial institutions because the income coming out of cotton and other commodities that really moved the economy of the United States. So it wasn't just them in the South, it was like you're saying, the, the impact it had around the country and the world. So when you start taking that away, they had to come up with different ways to get those same people in the cotton fields producing the same amount of cotton. But back to the back to these beautiful magazines. So Absolutely. we had because I want folks to really look them up. We had Ebony, we had Jet, we had Scipia, um, we had the Chicago Defender newspapers, and we had these porters 
who were yeah. all named George, who were running up and down the railroads attending white folks, but there was a whole society and economy that was evolving underneath those red caps. That, because of those newspapers, and most people don't realize, even the whites who were part of bringing people to the North were arrested. People carrying the Sapenda and the Pittsburgh were arrested and put in jail because they, didn't, they wanted to stop this. And that's a part of history people don't understand, how powerful those newspapers were and to the extent in which people of power in the South controlled that or tried to control it. Amazing. And so the migration took place. And of course, at the Second World War, you know, they needed women and they needed blacks, they needed different people in the steel mills and the armament shops. And so that's when we started creating different households and, and really the first generation of people making money. Who and, were a and, and so you're this kid growing up in the early 40s in Chicago. All this beautiful music is being created in Chicago under its own brand, under a special level of pain. You've got families who are separated from the South some running for the fear of their lives, some running for the hope of their future, but all running to Chicago in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, some places you just don't go. You're smelling fried chicken. You're listening to gorgeous music. You're seeing people who are dressing better than people in the South, but who still miss the freedom of running around land because they're living in tighter quarters. You're seeing all of this growing up and then education. That's right. And so we got educated, and, and, and I say this in the book, and, and, and I mean it in a very positive way. We had the greatest teachers that almost anyone could have. I you went to a public school. about one of your teachers. I know I'm jumping on you, Professor Lowry. You used to check <laughs> me for that in class. But you okay. talked about one of your teachers, and I thought, I said, okay, I have to blame her for how hard he was and how disciplined he was yeah. on me in class, because oh, no. you certainly are her protege, oh, <laughs> your favorite was, teacher. <laughs> she was my favorite teacher, Madeline Stratford. She was wonderful, and she had all these pictures of African leaders, not just black leaders, African leaders, all in our play, in, in our thing, and, and it was something. So it made you a proud black person coming up. And, and, and the Madeline Strappers, and there were a lot of people like that in our school system who would get jobs otherwise. I mean, because back in that day, it was school teachers, social workers, and postal workers. And that was basically the black environment. And occasionally you had some undertakers. And, and, some, some, preachers. and, and some preachers. Oh, you always got the preachers. You got the preachers. <laughs> you always got the preachers. That's right. That was it. But they were great teachers. They were dedicated. Some of them had two or three degrees. Some of them in eighth, in eighth grade had PhDs. You know, they were very educated, very skilled, and cultured people. So, and so Professor Lowry, on, on Sundays, my siblings and I, there are eight of us, and my brother renamed us a couple of Sundays ago, the Crazy Eights. So we do the Crazy Eights on Sundays, and it's usually two, two and a half hours that we visit together. We bring our assignments, this, week assignment, this week's assignment, uh, each person had to select a Black author, and guess who I selected? Oh, and no. Yes, and we have to bring our perspective on how they write as well as, you know, what we're reading by them. But one of the things that came up when one of my brothers selected his was, oh my goodness, I'm my older brother, sometimes I miss segregation. And that can sound really brutal and, oh no, don't say that. Let, we're not ready to have that conversation. Yet I understood the passion in his voice about even today living, and you're describing early 1940s in Chicago, he's describing today in Maryland, you know, sometimes I miss segregation. And I said, well, really, it's it, it, how you word it, because what I heard him to say is, sometimes I miss the community. That's the community, miss community. And all the work you've done since early 1940s till now, Somehow you've been able to create community, whether it is through the organizations that you support and bring expertise, whether it's the companies who you bring to light 
the advantages of diversity and inclusion, or whether it's simply the lectures that you give over and over again, and now your book. Somehow you give us the community we want. Um, how, do you, how do you level wanting that community of people that also had the big argument against segregation? I grew up in a segregated town. I know what it was like to feel a part of the nest and the community. I also knew what it was like to feel apart from the economy and the security. So how do you do what you do so well? Well, you know, I, I, I'll be very honest here. I think my mother, she died, she was 97 and a half. She was my best friend. And she was that black image of everything I thought was so great about our community. I mean, she cared. I'm, I'm tearing up almost talking about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I knew what I had to do. And I remember at her funeral, I said, Ma, I've done a lot. If you're gonna be looking down on me, I'm gonna do more. And uh, I'm being honest, and that's what I said, you know, and I was the last person to speak. Um, and so I always felt, no matter where I was, and especially being who I was during the times I was, very often I was the only black person in the room. Um, I had to adjust. But I always the had a privilege and the class. I beg your pardon. I think you'd say in the book that you felt like you you were in the underclass when you went to school. You go home and you were middle class and doing well. And when you go to school, okay. you were you 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 were not privileged. You see people roll up in their limousines right. dropping kids off. Yeah, and, and what the, your your people should know is that I went to a private school. Mm -hmm. So I went to a public school, and because my brother was very smart. He got into this private school before I did, and he brought me along. We were both athletes. And I, I never really left, and I'm sure this is true with a lot of people, you really didn't even know the other side of town. I mean, we're, we lived on the south side. And at best, sometimes we would go downtown, but we, very seldom did we go on the north side. Very seldom did we go into those, those big buildings on the lake where you had people at the front doors with, you know, fancy uniforms. That wasn't us. And it was always, later that you got your Harvard voice, right? <laughs> it was later I got my Harvard voice. You, you saw that line. I had three voices. I said, but I do that. So I, I came from the South Side, and all of a sudden I'm in this environment with all these rich kids, unbelievably smart kids. They've been reading Shakespeare ever since sixth grade. They, they, they can speak French. And there I was completely almost by myself. There were a few of us there, but there were some. My brother had graduated. And so I said, wow, this was really what one would, you know, I later when the Peace Corps, what we would call culture shock. Mm -hmm. And it was a real cultural shock. And so like we said, we were back on the South Side, we all played in the park, we all did, you know, basically had nobody had cars like that. But that's where you lived and that's how you came up. Then all of a sudden you're in the North Side and you see these limousines coming up and you're seeing people letting that out, the kids coming out. And what the school did, and it was very smart, the, the girls had to wear uniforms, the boys did, but they just didn't want the very rich because there was there were a lot of scholarship kids. So they didn't want them to be embarrassed with riches. And so the, the rich girls would show you that they had cashmere sweaters and other people had normal sweaters. They would let you know, it was subtle, but they let you know that they had money so all of a sudden, I'm in this environment. You know, I said, wow. But of course, I, it's a day school. So I'm going home every day, going back to my community, going back to my friends. And on the weekend, I'm, you know, I was too poor to be in Jack and Jill. I had the right color, but I was too, I was too poor. So I wasn't in Jack and Jill. So I'd go to the Jack and Jill party. So I lived about two or three different lives. I lived a life in, in the private school. Then I come back to Chicago to the Jack and Jill upper class black environment because I went to this private school. And then I dealt with the people I just knew from day one since you know I was five years of age. Freeze that, freeze that, that moment right there. You said, I live these different lives. Oh, how much that prepared you for the life you were about to have 
Yes. And how many African Americans today live two, maybe three different lives just to find the ability to support a family, get some personal enjoyment, and maybe be relevant to a community. I know so many who had their office voices and their home voices. And, and I'll tell you something funny, Professor Lowry, maybe you can help us with this a little bit. I've had several employees who've spoken to me who say that when they're working from home now, instead of going into the office, very often their children or their spouses or whoever else is in the house will ask them, why are you talking that way? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> Shh, mommy's got her office voice on, or quiet, right, right. quiet, daddy's got his office voice on. How many? I mean, talk about that. That is who we are. We've had to navigate different waters, and we've had to bring different tools to the work. Absolutely. I mean, you, you know I do a lot of diversity and inclusion. I mean, that's been my field. And I try and I do it diplomatically. I said, but let's, let's face it. You guys who were making the decisions, you guys who happen to be white, you have some very strong opinions on what you think quality is. You have very strong opinions on what people should look like. You have strong ideas of what is meritocracy and what is you know, the right way to do it. And if you come in there and, and you don't sound the right way and you don't act the right way, you don't dress, back in my day, you had to dress that way. We had three-piece suits when I first started McKinsey. We didn't have just suits. We had three-piece suits, okay, in order to be accepted uh, at 245 Park Avenue. So I knew what I had to do. I couldn't come in there wearing a yellow suit. I couldn't come in there using the same language I'd use with guys I played baseball with on the south side of Chicago. And you adjust. And, and I tell people in C-suite and CEOs, I'm sure you have too, you know, we had to survive. We had to learn how to live in two and three different cultures. You guys didn't have to. You defined the norms of your culture. You defined the norms of your community. You defined the norms now, we're getting into, it, into that, of what America should be like. Right, America yeah. appropriates so much of what is black culture, even oh. as we continue to strive, not yet thrive, in benefiting from that appropriation. And that's what I'd say. I mean, and, and I'm sure you've said it as well. It's like, when you finally let us play baseball, baseball was better off because of it. When you finally let us play football, football was better off. Basketball was, was going down the tubes until Will Chamberlain joined Philadelphia. The attendance was averaging 2,000 people. The league was going under. And then you had Wilt and you had other people, Kareem. And now, you know, kids are making, what, 50, 20, you know, $50 million a year. Everybody wants- 70% of the league. <laughs> you have a 70% of the league and even some coaches. So I think that the whole thing I'm saying, and when I usually get my talk, I say, look, when you look at our people, you know, there's gold in the hills. And you gotta look at our people like potential gold shining assets for your company, for your community. Just let them come out of the mine. Let them be polished, help them. And I tell them, if you do that, your company's gonna be stronger and it's gonna be a different, different world that we all live in. So accept the uniqueness, we are still unique. Janice, I said this for years. You are one of the most unique persons I've ever met. I well, that could be taken a lot of ways. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, because you you had, I mean, and it comes out, it comes out in your book, you have a way of looking at things and, and, and approaching life, and it worked. And you reach back and help Carlton, and you helped all your family members. That is unique. But you didn't stop. And that's why I asked that question the other day. You know, I knew what the answer was going to be why you were successful, but most people don't realize all you've done in your own quiet way because you were raised to do that. You were raised to have that mindset to reach back and help. You're reaching back now in STEM. I'm reaching back on, I'm helping the STEM scholars and, you know, and, you know UNCF. I mean, so we all feel we got to do this because it's the next generation. I really feel the next generation, they're going to get it. 
And I think these young people, irrespective of race and gender and sexual, you know, you know, desires or, or manifestations, really want to work together and make the world better, not just the United All States. All the essence of our humanness. Yeah. Here, I, I, let me ask you this. Do you know who the white folks were in your family? Now, that's a shocking question to ask out loud for many people, especially when you're in company. But many Black people ask that. Who are the white folks in your family? Usually, we trace it by the names and figure out who owned folks back then. But that's not always the best solution. Do you know who the white folks were in your family? Because y'all didn't look like that straight off the boat. No, I know. And then they make you do this, you know, do this ancestry test. And then they say, well, Laura, are you black? You're always pro-black, you're pro-black. But you 47% white. Right, right. <laughs> you're almost 50% white. And then they tell you where you came from and stuff like that. No, I don't. And then, uh, unfortunately, my, I don't know if you know Ron Galt. He's a cousin, distant cousin. And so we have this commonality, and we were going to do this, and he lost it. And he lost my ancestry because we were trying to trace it all back. But I don't. I, and that's one well, I'm going to have to put you on to my sister, Trish, because she's traced us back for a bit. But we're talking about you today, so we won't go into that. Here's yeah. the thing, though. The reason I ask you that is because... Um, I heard this statement made, and you know, you and I don't often get shocked, right? It takes a real big thing to shock us, right? right? Um, after you've seen a lot, and <laughs> you're wise to a lot. Uh, but I heard this statement, I think I, I, I quote, perchance I paraphrase, and it was, white folks are so afraid of black folks. Why? We've done the most for this country and the least to this country. I think I'm quoting them. And the room went silent. We were on a Zoom and the room went silent. And then the conversation went right past it. Now, I was not a participant in the discussion. I was audience. And I chatted back asking, could somebody give comment to that? Um, can you give comment to that? Well, you know, I give comment to almost anything. Yeah. It is so painful. I think as we deal with, in not dealing with names, why certain people can say the most vindictive, negative, condescending things in the world and get away with it because we have this fear of black people. We have, for whatever reason, because many people are saying it now, if if black people are given a chance and if black people are accepted as equal, then they are losing their power and their dominance. And I think the fear of that, even, even when they don't even have it, that's the sad thing that's going on in America now. They don't have the control. They think they have the control. They don't have it. And then that's for me is the saddest thing. And you know, even in my writing, I constantly say, I want to help blacks and browns, but I also want to pe help people who might be white, who are in need, really in need. And I want to help them as well, because it's poverty is poverty. I don't care what color you are. And if I can help people in poverty, I will do it. But the sad thing, many of those people I want to, might want to help in poverty will always dislike me, will always try and spike me down, will always try and say bad things about me and my brothers and my cousins. And I think that's one of the saddest things in America today. Well, you know, you can be impoverished in so many ways, definitely economically. You can be impoverished around societal lines. You can be impoverished of spirit and soul. I think one of the hardest rapes is of a person's mind and soul to rape them of promise and hope. Yes of belonging and opportunity. And I saw this minister who I, I on, 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 on a virtual uh, service, he was actually doing a fire chat side chat with David Ola. Let me get his name correct because we got to get our names correct out here. But I, maybe you've seen it, Professor Lowry. And it was with David Oyelowo. And mm -hmm. this minister said, um, told the story of a man being at home 
and a gentleman come into the door and his wife answered the door and he was selling products and he apologized to her by uh, saying that he was dirty and he probably looked like he was black, but he assured her he was white. He'd just been working outside. He said, I'm sorry I look black, but I am a white man. And the gist of it is that the husband never confronted that, never challenged that, never even tried to encourage away from that as a man of God. Uh, and you know that silence is violence kind of thing, whether it's yeah. in our home spiritually. But during this session, David Oyelowo talks about the solutions that we seek because it's such a multifaceted thing we're talking about now around Black Lives Matter. Now, you know, David is a Christian and he is hardcore Christian, okay? Bible quoting Christian. Don't have to read the text to quote the text, Christian. And he is rather new age as well because he's embracing of all things. And when, when he was talking, Professor Lowry, he was suggesting that the spiritual soul of America has to be altered, that the solutions around Black Lives Matter won't just be those that we can regulate, albeit we must regulate. It won't be those that we can navigate, although we must architect and navigate but that until the spirit and the soul, and he goes into different Jewish and Christian parables to suggest how God wants us to be and then iterates us through the ages. And as I was listening to this service delivered in a fireside chat manner, I kept thinking about your book and I kept thinking about you. You were the first person I think I heard mention you can regulate, you can't, you can't regulate the spirit, but you can regulate the behavior. And I thought mm -hmm. the two of you are compatriots in that this is not a, a, a singular path to the solution. It's complicated. And that's why I keep saying over and over, every seem like every week, 10 times a week, I say, look, these problems are 400 years old. They're too complex to become with, you know, neat little game plans that you can check off this and check off that and think it's going to, on Monday morning, it's going to be different. This is complex. You're dealing with complex issues, complex cultures, egos, power. People don't want to give away power, jealousies. So we have to just say, we're going to take this on. And I think you're absolutely right. I, there was a very brilliant young lady who was from the University of Virginia. And she wrote a piece and said, let's, let's throw out the whole issue of using diversity as a business case. She says, it doesn't work. I mean, you can, you can take Angemama off and all like that. And it's not going to affect the product. The product's going to still, still be sold. But it's a morality. And we ought to really support those companies who believe in the right things because it's the moral thing to do. It might be tricky. But that is the real thing that one should really gauge on. To what extent a company is willing to do the moral things and the right thing, both short term and long term. Well, well, well let's take, take your life then, because I often thought, and when I read your book, you know, I, I laughed and I cried. And anybody who doesn't read your book has cheated themselves of an incredible journey. Um, I let me put that in a positive. Everybody's got to read your book so they can enjoy this incredible journey. One that you're still on that you've not given stop. Right. Right. Um, so one of the things that I kept thinking was, oh my God, what was a young Jim like? He lived so much. Maybe he'd had to experience too much by the time you landed on your first professional job before you did Harvard. Um, but it certainly seeded in you the things that helped you to make so much change in these corporations. We, we talked about your grandparents and, and, you know, running from a lynching. We talked about your parents arriving in Chicago and mom being at home a bit, but then going out to work and help dad. And you guys were smart at your way. Even if you couldn't pay your way, you're smart at your way into top schools and, 
and now you're landed in corporate America and you could have been, you know, that magic Negro at the, at the water fountain. <laughs> didn't settle for that what what happened why I mean talk to us about what was going on inside you and what was going on around you that allowed you the boldness the bravery to support your brilliance in in, in working forward you did some first you know you did some first I think you left out one year that was so impactful on me mm. and that was a year I went to Tanzania Amen. 22 years of age. Amen. So here I am, this kid who's from Chicago, spent four years in small liberal arts college in Iowa, played three sports. And all of a sudden, I'm on a plane going to Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Pre Peace Corps. Pre Peace Corps. Mm -hmm. The first Peace Corps volunteers came to Dar es Salaam. They were engineering architectural group. I was there to meet them. So I was even before the Peace Corps. And to be in this country, smelling Africa, looking at Africa, seeing Africa change, seeing colonialism go down, going to places where I saw slaves were put on boats, had a profound impact on Jim Lyle, the young Jim Lyle. You're getting ready to make me cry. I'm leaning in for my <laughs> It ain't gonna be cute up in here in a minute. I don't cry pretty. But, but, but that's what happened. And it, I, would I was never the same after that. I was never the same. And I was there when that Union Jack flag went down on December 9th, 1961. I was there. And I met the kings and queens. I spent Roosevelt's son was representing the United States and Senator Capel. I'm 22 years of age. I'm just this young guy. And I said, I said initially, I think I want to spend the rest of my life trying to help those less fortunate on the continent of Africa. And I was. I, I planned on doing that. And then the Peace Corps hired me. So I then became a training officer at the Peace Corps. And I went and got a master's degree in international. Yeah, you know, I still think I was going to do international. Then I went to Peru. And Janice, I saw the same things in Peru. I saw the slums of, of Peru, of Lima. That's where we had our volunteers, in, in the slums. I saw a city going up with 200,000 people and didn't have water. And I said, wow. And that's where I met Bobby Kennedy. I was Bobby Kennedy's host and his translator, you know, with the Peace Corps when I became associate director there. I said, wow. And I believed in everything he believed in. And I, had, I didn't know John Kennedy, but I knew Bobby Kennedy. And I think Bobby Kennedy probably lost his life because he believed in the right things. And he wanted to you know, change America the right way. And so I worked in Brooklyn. And so it was the experience of Africa, the experience of Lima, Peru, working in the Barriadas, living in the slums of, in Africa, going out hanging out with my students and, and dancing with my students and just accepting them for being who they were and, and realizing that they were going to be the leader of their country in, in a 10 year period of time that, you know, I said, wow, you know, I think I'm going to stay home and try and help our people as well. And so when, when my heroes were killed, John Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, Malcolm X, and King, I didn't know what to do. I was so depressed because we were on such a good, positive mood. And people you knew, not just heroes of fall. No, no, I knew them. You know, and so, and so they were close to me. I was on that train that took Bobby Kennedy's body, okay, mm -hmm. from New York. I was at the funeral in the down the first rows to take that body to D.C. I was on that train, saw people waving the flags for Bobby Kennedy. So when McKenzie came along, it was a good break for me. It was, it was a good break. I didn't plan on it. I had to go through 10 interviews to get the job. And initially, I didn't even know if I wanted to do the job. You know, mm. I didn't know how important that would be in my life to be the first Black person at McKenzie. I didn't even know that much about McKenzie. 
by how powerful it was, how powerful the industry was. And so I did it and I learned a lot. I learned about business. I learned how corporations work. I learned about yeah, the trade. inside of being a change agent. I, I, that's where I got all my skills. I said, but I always said, I'm going to use my skills first to bring in other black people in McKinsey. I recruited 19 black people <laughs> in the first six months. Because I said, other people got to learn these skills. Wait, too. I want you to repeat that because there are companies today who suggest they can't find 10 good black people in a year. You recruited oh. how many in the first month? 19. 19. Okay? 19. <laughs> first month. I went back as a consultant with James A. Slotter and Associates. They were down to four, 10 years later. Down to four, four blacks. And one of them was Roger Ferguson, who was the chairman of TA Crep, right? On the board at Google. One of them was here. He was one of those guys. And I wrote a letter to the president. I said, how can you have only four black people? When I was here, I recruited 19 myself. I have to give him credit. He said, okay, come to New York, let's talk. He put, the, put me together with a senior partner. He said, you guys affect change. You make it happen, okay? You solve the problem. We increased that number of four to 104 in two years. 104 blacks at McKinsey in two years. And I one of them- Wow, how to do that. And you suggest it wasn't that difficult to do it. The difficulty it was getting people to want to do it. Is that still true? And it's so true. I just said that early on today. I said, you gotta invest time in people. You understand people better than anybody else. And, and, and so a lot of these people, they weren't mean spirited. They didn't understand it. They couldn't communicate. You know, and, and the fact that I had been at McKinsey for seven and a half years played a big role. So if I'd bombed out and hadn't been done well, or if my company had not done well, and they take pride in Jim Lowry being the first black. And let me tell you about Jim Lowry and his company was rated, Jim Lowry's company was rated one of the top 100, you know, consulting firms in the country. So now, you know, I'm, I'm one of them, but they trusted me. And I said, this is what you got to do. And they trusted me. But we dealt with people as opposed to institutions and policies. And I think that's why the whole industry has not been as effective as it should. Because they think by posting things and doing decks and you know doing best practices, but it's all about people. It's so okay. hard for me to, 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 to wrap my head around this, let alone how you must have wrapped your head around it. We do the things that are hard, right? Because simple doesn't mean easy, does it? No. When we look at it, I mean, you said earlier, Professor Lowry, you said, look, when Blacks got into baseball, baseball got better, basketball got better. I, we could go on, music got better, medicine got better. Um, business, is that the last bastion of the great reserve? That's it. That is it. But let's go back to where we started this conversation. And you know, I say this in the book. It's all economic. Mm -hmm. Okay? And if you really, the term I've used throughout my life is follow the money. Follow the money. It will tell you why things are done or why things are not done. And so I think that is the last passage. And, and I say this in the book, and I thought I'd be criticized. I haven't been really criticizing it. I think our early leaders, our elected officials, civil rights leaders, were great people. They were good people. They're my dear friends. I knew Reverend Larry and I, these are my friends, but they didn't understand business. Mm -hmm. They did not understand the free enterprise system. They didn't know that by getting capital and creating entrepreneurs like you and others, that we could get a seat at the table and affect change, you know? And I'm just saying, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't understand that. And so what we did, we started, and we're still doing it, focusing on getting larger government budgets to take care of the problems of blacks and brown. You make, put capital in the hands of bright young people, we will create our own economics. We will create our own jobs. We will create 
assets for this country that will fortify the economic stability of our country. Because mm -hmm. you can't have close to 40% of your population on a government dole. So it, it doesn't work. The economic and the money doesn't stay in the community. The money is really a recycled effort back to the corporations. I remember you teaching that. Now, I think you were lecturing. I don't think that was part of our Kellogg class, but I remember you very deliberately pausing and asking us to think about that. How you ask us how much government money stays in the hands of black folks. And you told us it was a very simple way to ask to answer that. How many of those black folks run business off of the government handouts? That's right. And I See, thought, wow, this man, how do white people keep liking him when he's walking around <laughs> saying this stuff? <laughs> Well, that's true. That's true. You know, it, and between me and you, I didn't know how people were going to take that book. You know, my, my old partners at BCG, they all like it. They all like the book. And, you know, they, because I, I tell it like it is. You know, I tell it like it is. Well, you and not I, only tell it like it is, the other thing you do is, I wouldn't say you're a seer. You know how back in the day, folk used to say he's a seer. Some people call him visionary. Some people, you know, the crystal ball thing, but you're always ahead of the readiness, yet you have an ability to help people get there. You mentioned yourself, your book, it was there before COVID, it was there before BLM, and it was there in a way that people could receive it and hear it and learn from it. And maybe I answered my own question, maybe white folks like you, because you deliver truth with data and with stories that are honest and clear for people to understand. That's right. And, I, and That's what I, your book does. That's what your book does in, in sharing your life with us. You share yeah. it in an honest way and, a, and in a way that's clear for us to understand. And you've done that at more than one, 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 uh, great consultancy firm. Yeah, can you talk, can you continue the conversation on that? About the consultancy firms? Yeah, and the changes yeah. you were able to make. I mean, these are the people advising people, but you're the people right. who are advising the people who are advising people. Right, I, I think, you mean, they're great firms. I mean, we recruit from, the, as you know, from the best schools, and we get the best talent, the best students out of all those schools we invest millions and millions of dollars to training them, you know, I mean, millions and millions of dollars. So the end product's a great end product, but a lot of them, they don't have the street smarts. They haven't been exposed to the things that I think are so valuable in trying to make your journey that much fuller and enjoyable and fun. And so if you just work, you know, 24 seven, seven days a week, you can produce profits. You can you expand the market. You could do all kinds of things like that, reduce cost, but you want to enjoy life. And so that's what I tried to do and share in the book that I always had a balanced view of my life, where it was and where I wanted to be throughout my life. You know, so I talk, I talk about my six Fs, you know, fame, fortune, fun, family, fitness, and faith. Yes. So you try, you got to pick, you know, and I can still swim a mile at my age. I can still do do planks at my age. I can, because I, because I think a good, strong body feeds towards a good, strong mind. Mm -hmm. And I'm religious, but not deeply religious, but I'm very spiritual. Mm -hmm. So it, it always, is, it's part of my life. You could see it in my writing. You see it where I deal with people, how I love people. I love people. I don't let oh, you tolerate my prayers and sprinkling water well. <laughs> <laughs> I, Janice will have me praying every day. No, but <laughs> I'm serious. I, you know, and you know, but I respect that. Prayer people. without works is dead, isn't it? That's right. That well, we we've seen that. We've seen that all over. So I, I think I tried to do that and, and, and that's why I I get up every morning. I feel good about being who I am. Because I've helped other people, I made enough money. You know, I don't have your kind of wealth, but I got I got a few millions in there. So after a while, you only need it for so much. You make more, you got more people coming after you. So mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I got my millions, but I've done it. But it was never number one. It was never more number than one. enough is abundance. That's it. That's it, it doesn't matter how much more. 
That's it. As long as I got enough money, I can qualify and invest in new stocks. Then mm. I got enough money. Mm. That's why I looked at. That's why I always look at. The average person doesn't even realize that. And you don't need too much more, because I'll tell you, since I've been in lockdown on COVID and blessed to live in an area that I can take walks through trails, I've been wearing those 1970s and <laughs> early 1980s track suits out. Right. And bless her heart, my executive aide said, oh, you look so nice. That is fine. And I looked at it and I laughed. I said, honey, this track suit is older than you are. <laughs> And I was telling the truth, but more than enough is abundance, you know? Yes. And then you got to share. I mean, you share, I share. If you don't, you know, you got to share, you know, you got to, you share to make a difference. And, uh, and, and that's why I've been really on this whole thing of having people of color, especially black people to understand the free enterprise system in a different kind of way. And to create, as you know, more people who can make businesses and grow businesses and do like you do, be in 30 different countries. Because if people don't realize this is a global technological economy, and if we don't adjust to that, you ain't going to survive. And we got to have more businesses survive who are run by people of color. So what is the change agent? What is the change agent for the people who haven't yet gotten the book? Because they all going to get it. I think the change agent, we've kind of talked around the different things, but it's really a unique journey. It has been a unique journey, coming from the south side of Chicago, going to private schools, living in Africa twice, decentralizing the government of Tanzania, you know, and, and, and starting my own company, being at McKinsey. I, I'm not, there ain't too many people have done that. And it's such a unique journey. I just in that, I think, it's important to say everybody has their own journey. And so you would accept, you know, we should do it. I think the other thing I'm trying to say in the book, we're all products of our times. So I know about you having to, you know, have people bodyguard you going to school. Those are the products of time you came up as a kid. We're all products of what's happening. These younger kids now, my daughter who you met, she's a different way. I mean, so she's second, third generation. She's got a different attitude. But I think, we got to take advantage of the situation, but also be a change agent and win the times of the cheap function. So I never wanted to just take a paycheck. Never. Everywhere I wanted to go, and it wasn't done because I'm arrogant or anything like that. I wanted to say Jim Lowry has been here and he made it a better place. It's I know you did team. that with NMSDC, National Minority Supplier Development Council, and um, during the time that I first met you. And I remember you made such an impact for Ford Motor Company. Right. Um, what motivated you to actually want to do that? Because even though that was early uh, for many of us, you'd already, <laughs> you proven you. Why did you want to invest your talent in that? Well, it, it gets back to my skill set. I mean, if you've been on the, if you've been on the inside, right? And then I remember the early days, it just intellectually, it, it puzzled me why we were settling for so little. And when we did our first work at PepsiCo, Pepsi-Cola, the first thing I did boldly, because that's what I'd done at, at McKinsey, I said, okay, I want to see how much money you buy. I mean, I want, I want to know your total purchasing dollar. They said, what? I said, I want to know what you I can't help you unless I know you got the numbers. And so when I looked at the total amount of money they were buying every year, I said, okay, what percentage of this goes to people of color and women? It, was, it wasn't even a rounding figure. It was nothing, you know? So they said, I said, but you can at least increase it to three to 5%. They said, are you serious? I said, you give me, help me. You get, let me work with you two years and I'm gonna make sure you can do it three to 5%. Now the trick, because a lot of people don't want to give up things. They don't want to give up power. They want to give up those special relationships. It was a lot of hard work, but I had a goal. Three to five percent. I had a goal. And Pepsi did it. And basically we used what we called a, a device called a pain game. And we had certain things where it would be harder to penetrate corporate America. But there were certain things that you could do. And, and, and I'm not taking credit for it, but 
advertising agencies. We had some very talented ad advertising agencies. And once we got them in, they did a great job. Tom Burrell at McDonald's and people, you know, they, they mm -hmm. got the other guy. I got him Burger King, Coca-Cola, we got them in. So they became big players. They became multimillionaire because they got the opportunity. So that was one of the easy sells in your business. I said, there are some firms out there, you know, and they can do more than what you want to do, just one off. They can do staffing. They can do professional. We can do that. I got Joe Ariola, the contract to do Ford's and the report because mm -hmm. he had all the right machinery to be able to do that. So I got people thinking. And Ford this. had Ray Jensen, Dr. Ray Jensen. And, and between me and you, I say this every year. Ray and I and Jesse Jackson were a great team. We are a great team. Ray cared. He listened to me. And I say it in the book. I say, Ray, I don't know anything about Ford, and you don't know anything about minority business. So let's be partners. And he looked at me like I was crazy. We became partners. He ended up being in my wedding. I mean, real we close. But you know, Janice, there's never been another executive, a minority business executive in, in the Hall of Fame, except Ray Jensen. Mm -hmm. And then Jesse did what he did. He had the right to go and talk to the president, but he always bring Ray Jensen in. So Ray Jensen was there. So we did it, but we had a goal. And it was very clear. It was just what I learned in McKinsey. They all compete against each other. So General Motors was competing against Ford, Ford, Ford against Chrysler. I said to Ford, I said, look, if, now I don't know if it's true, but I thought it was true. I said, if you can hit a billion dollars, now I know how much they're buying, so that ain't a lot of money. But if you can do a billion dollars and advertise, you did the first corporation to do a billion dollars with minority, more minorities gonna buy your car. We hit the billion. Guess who came up the next year and did a billion? General Motors Chrysler. But it was just, these are the skill sets I learned that I could transfer to my field, which was minority business development. You know, I've got, I've got several clients. When I say several, I mean several uh, who could do a billion dollars a year with my company and not do it just in procuring good services, but actually add strategic advantage, competitive advantage to their own company. And I haven't figured out yet, even as we've made great strides in our company, how to break the mindset of investing that type of money in their own future by procuring it through my company. Somehow that label of she or black starts to chip away at how beautiful it could be. I, I have, if you want to know my business dream, it is to have six companies we do business with right now do a billion dollars a year with us and they could easily do, I, let me put it this way, it would be simple for them to do it. I don't know why they don't see that it's easy to do. And that's we what got, I'm working on there. I put myself out there, Professor Lowry. Well, you know, we will continue this conversation because I, you know, nobody I'd rather help than you. And in my book, I said, just think how America would change if we had 20 billionaires in 10 cities or 10, 10 billionaires in 20 cities who were black. Think how many scholarships are going to historically black colleges. Just think of how many jobs, would be, how many heroes we would have. And that's what, I, and people say, well, Larry, you shouldn't be talking about billions. I said, why not? Why not? That's, the big families that are change, the change agents in our world, all you gotta do is do pick up, you know, Forbes every year. Who would be there? They're affecting change. Well, we, look, named, we named the stadium at North Carolina A&T, my yeah. uh, university. But you know, my goal is not to name a stadium. My goal, uh, uh, not the stadium, we named the, uh, the box. My goal is not to name a box. My goal is to name that school of engineering at a and Absolutely. That's it. You know? Because that's what we have to do. We have to, 
and I say this, we have to find those young geniuses. I know they're there. I know that there's a, a you know, a person who's, I'm not going to use names, but there's some CEOs in Silicon Valley. I know we can have some black virgin. We just got to identify them, support them, train them, invest money in them. And that's what I think, you know, the opportunity right now represents. Mm -hmm. I think for the first time, corporations are talking about doing that. And, and, and you know, my dear, wonderful friend, if there's any time you got a chance to be those, get those six companies, it's now. Because at it, it, AT&T, I know for a fact, because I was advising AT&T, they do do annually a billion dollars with one black person. So, you know, with the right ones, and AT&T is a good company. I mean, AT&T is doing 17 billion, you know, with, with, with people of color. Three billion specifically for blacks. So now's the time, and I'm advising people, I'm supporting my partners at the business roundtable. You know what I'm gonna say. I'm gonna say, if you're serious, let's create some big businesses on the south side of Chicago. Let's create some big businesses in LA. Let's create some big businesses in the Bronx. You got land in some of these, but you got plenty of land in Chicago. And we need this. We need it for a lot of different reasons. Many of the bond, if you look at the, the, the municipal bond situations, they can't pay for all these things because they're paying too much out and not receiving enough in. So that's what I said. It's about it's about America. And these about businesses America. create homeowners and homeowners Absolutely. care about communities and communities support local businesses and local businesses buy from big companies and big companies. Right. I mean, it is such a self-fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> yeah, you can't quit. You 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 mentioned <laughs> once in an interview that people ask you why are you still out there? I'm going to paraquote on your hustle. Why are you still in the game? You could, you could go to that island. You could buy the island. Uh, but you still work every day, and so you're still on your first hustle. Um, I'm not going to ask you why, because anybody who's listened to you for even a few minutes understands why. I'm going to ask you, where do you think you are in this? Where do you think we are? I mean... If, if we're talking about a 24-hour clock, what hour are we? That's a good question. Uh, I don't want, I, I want to be positive. I always, I, you know, I always look at the glass half full. And I've seen a lot of good things. I think the business round table, many of the people you know on it, are opening their eyes to hear things differently. I think if Shelly Stewart is talking with them, they're listening as well, right? He's chairing it now. Uh, uh, and when see, and then this is the beauty of what we're talking about. Shelly Stewart the third is at McKinsey, and they've come out with some brilliant work on wealth disparity and how it affects black people. That's his offspring. Okay, so Shelly is our buddy. Shelly was at DuPont. You know, and uh, you know, but he had a child that went to Wharton, and his son is writing this brilliant piece of work with two other black kids at McKinsey, and the work is fantastic. We, I got people working at BCG on the same thing, so now we're writing about this, we're documenting it, but we're also putting it in a way in which I've always taught. We're saying if you do this for this population, America would be better. Off. Yes. America will be better off. So it's not for Joe Washington or Sam Jones. It's America would be better off. And so we're pretty, we're pretty consistent on our message. And it's my strong belief. And I always say this. And, uh, you know, we got to get everybody pulling on this to make it happen. But we can do it. And if we want to say this is some, I mean, you, you go in a proud world, but the world ain't what it used to be like 20 years ago where Americans and Brits could do what they wanted to do. It's a different world out here now. Different allegiances. Well, the advantage of technology has created so many transparencies, oh, I know. even in the quick aftermath of initially with technology, so many people thought they could do so much and they could harness it. 
but technology has a way of delivering itself forward. So whatever you've done, number one, you got a blueprint and you got a footprint. Okay. Right. Um, right. But also, I think, Professor, tell me if you agree that with technology, things that were made to seem difficult or distant now become better patterned. You can find pattern in things and with patterns, things become easier. Absolutely. Plus, I mean, you, you touch on something else. Which may be creating fear. I'm well, sorry. it's fear, but you're also talking about, you got to stay on top of this because it changes so fast, even in your business. Yes. You, you got to stay ahead of the game. If you, you don't have your technology chops, your tech chops, you can't survive. And Every listen, business is in the tech business. That's right. Doesn't matter. It's not just tech. No business can exist, even, even almost the mom and pop, without tech. It might be a low-end tech. Africa, they're out there, where are you getting the energy? It's safe for solar. They're oh doing I, I was blown away when the last time I was in Africa, geez, and I saw, um, I saw these people starting and running businesses and got to quite a size, and the only tech they had was a cell phone. But wow, what tech is in that cell phone? You know, people, and, and look, they were, they were figuring out ways to solar power those cell phones. That's right. It's a new world. Mm -hmm. And that's it, another it thing. Is. I, you know, you know, I don't like to be a Pollyanna. You say you, you like to think on the positive side. I get called a Pollyanna often. And I do think, though, that we will see progress. We have to be very clear about how we identify progress, to your point earlier, about understanding the difference between social and economic progress. And without both, each are at risk. Um, well said. I, I do think we see that. I, I think that everything till now has been a platform for it, but we called it progress but I think it was setting the platform for it. When you can name the top two this, when you can name the first that, you're not in, you, that, that's not the progress, that's the platform for it. It says it can happen because one did it or two did it. When you can't name them that there are so many, then I think you're in the process of it. Does that make sense? Absolutely. It's in the numbers. I mean, you take, I, I use, he used Cubans in, in Miami. Okay, Cubans came over. They didn't have anything. Castro kicked them out. They own Miami now. They work together. They have their own banks. They have their own everything. They coalesce. They invest in one another. And I think that that's the goal that black people I'm going to tell you, it's not that blacks have a tribe because we talked about Tulsa, right? And I'm going to yeah. find this on my uh, text message. I have my sibling text group. I told you about us having our Sundays and not that one. I can't share that one with you. That one's kind of crazy. But, uh, okay. you know, my siblings are crazy. You know Carlton. You know, you know I know Carlton. You know right? I know him. But there is this one. You may hear a little bit of noise when I open it up. But I'm going to open it to make sure that I get the right name of it. Um, and I you want you to the library in Wilmington, North Carolina, in 1898. That's it. And I want you to go on. You can find it on YouTube. I'll share it with you. Uh, Wilmington, North Carolina. That was a prosperous community of Black people. Oh, I know. And, 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 and it goes into how the election process tore them up. There was some looting and burning, too. But you had Tulsa that was like, in less than 48 hours, you had destroyed 48 hours. how many millions. I mean, people are familiar with that now, you know. But the, my point in bringing Wilmington, North Carolina up is, number one, my dad's folks are from there. But number two, and, and we, are the, we are the result of that effort. But number two, it happened everywhere, kind of like George Floyd had the light put on his neck. But a lot of necks were were kneed in in the dark. And so I do think that Blacks have done what we're talking about. 
I think the thing is not to lose heart because even if you have to do it over and over and over until it is the thing that is done, we must. And, and the state of mind. I mean, you think about Chicago, the original giants in, in black economic development were, were people from Chicago. I mean, you, you had the Defender and the Abbots. You had George Johnson, the Johnson product. You, you know, I mean, you had John Johnson of Ebony. And unfortunately, they didn't pass it from generation to generation. And that's why I'm so proud of you. And I'm not saying that you're here, because it's always been your plan to have it family in multi-generation. Well, and let's be let let's be complete because you do tell the truth. You tell the truth post James Lowry. Because we've hit on lightly, and in my introduction, I did mention being a student of yours. Um, but I didn't tell this story. And I think it's important that we share this uh, and remember it together. Um, you've been such a friend. Oh, God, I don't want to get emotional. Um, you've been such a friend and teacher. And even though you're more spiritual than I'm a little bit religious, <laughs> you 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 shared the prayer. And I did think about selling the business all, what, 24 years ago? Mm -hmm. And you encouraged me not to. You told me that the joy that you saw that I spoke from and the joy I had to learn suggested that it was more than a generation. And I had not thought about multi-generational business before then. And I was very excited and proud of someone who made an offer for my business. I remember, I know the company. <laughs> and um, you told me you never hold it against me if I made that decision, but you hold it against yourself if you didn't ask me to question that decision. And I'll forever love you for that. And I'm grateful. And my son upstairs, who's quarantined here with me in Los Angeles today, and my daughter, our daughter, who's just across the city, they thank you. So in this home, and in this house, you have a very special place because you did, you did. So go ahead with your story, but we got to tell the truth. And you know, I, I grew up where they taught us, Professor Lowry, that um, if you deny him on earth, you may be denied in heaven. Well, I ain't gonna put you to the level of Jesus. <laughs> no, don't. <laughs> but, but you have preached gospel to me, and I'm grateful. So thank you. Now go with your story. Go on. Well, I just think about we got to build a cadre of very powerful models doing it the right way. And you're a powerful model. I think there are other models coming up as well. But some of these truths are just so obvious, you know, you could always sell. I mean, if you, if the things that I've always fought and, and articulated we have to stop doing is suddenly you, you, you make it to C-suite C -suite, and you forget to talk about other people of color because you feel your position will be, you know, jeopardized if you help other people. I, I've never been against that. I've never been for people getting on boards and can't even spell diversity just because they, they have to have a black person on the board. You know, and I think some of the black people were probably very skilled in, in, in saying the right things have made a difference in these corporations, but they were different. And sometimes you got to take a chance. on them. But I also think we have to think beyond, you know, just having a leisure business and having two cars in the garage and sending the kids to college and start dealing with the foundation that you have to represent or be a part of for the larger black community. And I strongly believe that. I've always believed that. I've seen it with the Jewish families. I've seen it with the Greek families. I've seen it with the Iranian families. I've seen it where they had this vision of second and third generation. As you know, I wrote a, 
a chapter, an open letter to the to the next generation because I think that they have to do it. But what I did, I did bring the book. I didn't do it to advertise the book, but I did say in dealing with what was happening in our country, and this is before a lot of stuff happened. It was before Restmore and all the rest of this. And somebody said, don't put this in the book. I said, I gotta be true to myself. Why am I still staying motivated? And I said, I made the following commitments to myself to keep a positive mental attitude and believe in things will get better. Two, to love in my heart for those people close to me, my community, and even the people who hate me for the color of my skin. Educate the younger generation in our national history, both good and bad, to prepare them to be better leaders in the future. Foster business through growth and strategic partnerships with people of goodwill, irrespective of color, religion, or gender. Five, continue to write books and articles and give speeches to educate, motivate, and inspire others. Six, ask my friends and allies to also write books like you did or share their experiences with the larger community. Seven, reach out to leaders in both parties, especially persons of color, to do the right thing for the community that they represent and for America. Eight, invest in more time in my Professor, life. Professor, before you go to eight, because you are laying <laughs> it out for us so beautifully, I want to make sure you come back and talk about seven a little bit as well. Please continue, but we got to come back and talk about seven. We got to come back seven. All right. Eight, invest more time in my lifelong passion of minority business enterprise development with the goals of creating billion dollar businesses in cities across the nation. Nine, share the business case for diversity in major corporations across the country. And 10, we continue to reach out to students and young professionals to motivate and inspire them to be outstanding leaders in the next generation. That's why I'm not retired. And that's my commitment to myself. Now, when we talk about seven, that's a big conversation and that's a book in and of itself. What and you and I are gonna have to do is we're going to have to sit down and we're just going to have to do this again and read through the book chapter by chapter and have a conversation because it's just so much. There's so much in it. I do want you to talk about seven and remove it from the commitment to yourself. Move it to how we all can join that commitment because we're in some particular times right now and not just as the United States, but as, as a world. We are. I was on a conversation today with a major corporation in England. And of course, the corporation leaders were saying, why do we have to do this? This is an American problem. And you know me, I'm sort of like, you. Yeah, nah, it's not an American problem. Have you been looking outside the windows? They're tearing down statues in London of slavers. They're headed toward Winston Churchill. That's right. I mean, so this is, and if you think, and then I, I say this often. I think how, I think Harry and Megan to, uh, 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 this week, maybe today, uh, had a conversation with Europe to encourage them it's not an American problem. It's not an American problem. All you have to do is go to the same communities where we can bring them. I've been there. Those, you know, I talked about the slums in Africa. You can go to slums in London. Most of the people there are black and brown. I've been there. That middle passage, right? It didn't end in America. It didn't end in America, okay? And these people are angry. And I said, okay, if you want to look at America, just look at it and look like canary in the, in the coal mine. And you see when that canary dies, that's telling you something serious problem. Look at America. That's canary. You better see what's coming over here soon. Because it really gets back to what you're saying in technologies and phones and stuff like that. It, 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 you, can't, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. So how are you going to deal with it? you got to deal with it. And, 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 and earlier, I had, I had mentioned to you, uh, remember the conversation we had around, and you answered beautifully, 
around the idea that um, the question about why America is so afraid of blacks when blacks have done more for America, so much for America and so little to America. I don't know that that's the case across the world, but I know in America that blacks have had a lot of burning and looting happen to blacks. Oh, yeah. And the what we choose to memorialize suggests something different. So I think you are onto something about let us be a case study. Let us be um, not just a forewarning, but a case study for other nations as they look at how we saw through this. Because I am, again, at risk of being called the Pollyanna. I'm not simply hopeful. I'm not simply prayerful. I am thoughtful and convinced we will work through this. We have to. I tell you one thing, I tell you what the elephant in the room is. Um, don't want to get you in trouble, but the elephant in the room, with all these discussions going on, all the meetings, all the commitments, all the new funding, nobody is talking about the impact the drug trafficking and drug addiction have in the black and brown community. You don't, you don't see that anymore, do you? And so I said to a CEO, because, you know, they will say, you know, I try to be nice. You know, I'm nice like you. I learned from you to be kind of smile and say, but they said, well, you know, if you just had two, two people in the household, you know, most of this crime would go away. Or, you know, or if people would go to church. You know, what's wrong with the black? So many, so they will say all the things are wrong with us. You know, that's why you got this and you got that and you got crime. And I said, have you ever thought about the impact of the amount over an extended period of time since the mid 60s to now? How much heroin and cocaine and crack cocaine came into Harlem, came into Watts, came into the South Side of Chicago? how that tears away a family, how that makes people do things that they don't even want to do because they have to do it to survive. Just think of the rippling effect. And I have to give the guy credit. He was a CEO. Do you think that has, do you think that, and I'm asking this sincerely, I'm not propping you. Do you think that has the potential of implication that we've been taught alcohol had for Native Americans? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, nobody wants to talk about it. You know? Why don't people want to talk about it, Professor? I think it's huge. I mean, you, you follow the money? It's huge. We're talking about billion. Wait a minute. Escobar when he was at the height of his power in Colombia, was one of the richest people in the world. In the world. He was listed in Fortune. He's one of the, you know, that's a lot of money. So you have a lot of money and you got a lot of people going to be, you know, part of this whole thing. And, you know, Nancy Reagan was talking about just don't do drugs. But it, it's, you got to do more than that. You got to do more than that. Because I know the impact, and, and I tell people, they said, Jim, why is Chicago coming up? And we had it yesterday. Two little kids were shot in, in drive-by. And then there, you're going to see this on television. You know, and, and you see it too often, you know? Well, you say we got to do more than talk. I know you. You're pretty prescriptive, and you don't look at a problem without thinking right. on a solution. Not right. to suggest that you have a solution. Where do you think we go for and with a solution? You obviously have to go. And we did, we did this in Turkey. You have to go where it's being grown, where it's being harvested. You know, we've had some great successes. DAA has had some great successes. But, I mean, to get him, that took a lot of work. So that's, once again, if you want to solve the problem, you got to invest the money. So I think that's it. But even when you get here, we know who's trafficking in this stuff. I had a policeman tell me he got off the police force because he, he knew on what, when the route was coming, 
into Chicago, and he said, we didn't do anything about it. I, he quit, and he began, uh, became a, a policeman with the University of Chicago Police Force. He, he didn't he want he to do it. And then they're just corrupting these young kids because you deal with the, the just the position of you know young kids, especially blacks at this point. They don't want to work at McDonald's. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. They don't want to work at McDonald's. I, McDonald's has done a lot for black people. I know they made a lot of black millionaires, but they don't want to work at McDonald's. So if they can make more money on hanging on the corner and, and taking that corner and growing it, they're going to grow the corner. And so that's what most of these kids are being shot up on. They're just fighting over corners in Chicago. This is my turf. And that's what it's all about. But when you think about it, you don't read about this in the paper. You read about the little kids being shot as tragically as that is. But I said the book. I said, you know, it's just like Ernest Hemingway said, to whom the bell tolls. So every time one of the little kids is get shot in, in, a, in a drive by, that's all of us are hurt. We all should feel that pain. Not do you just think that's people. true, though? I mean, <clears throat> what? They, do you think that every time a little kid is shot, that's all of us hurting? I, 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 I know where you're coming it from. It should be. So the no, I'm just saying, we don't, but we should. I'm saying that we should. Mm -hmm. No, I think you, they weren't. I think most people, when they read it, they see it, and there's, oh, there's a, good, a bunch of animals in, in the south side of Chicago. You know, God, you know, I don't have to go to church. You know, they should go to church. But I'm just saying, no, to your point, I, I knew it was a historical question. They don't, and they should. They really should. Because it's symptomatic. All I'm saying to you, it's symptomatic of a bigger problem that we're just kicking that can down the road. Uh, what did Dr. King say? It's, it's easy to say, why don't you lift yourself by your bootstrap, but you're talking to people who don't even have a boot. Right. Is that true if we think, and I don't want to get me in trouble either, but I'm going to ask you this. It, is that true then if to, today, if the suggestion I heard, I heard, not to say you said it, I heard from your conversation, your comment was that there's a lot of money on the corner. That I'm not going into McDonald's because there's a lot of money on the corner. So um, is that still true then, that there are no boots on the corner? Well, I think a better analogy would be, there might be some sneakers, but there ain't no Air Jordans on them people's feet. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so in this world we live in. So Michael got know? his name on some. And he became a manufacturer, well, not a manufacturer, but a, go with me. Take us deeper. Well, I'm just saying a kid I might to walk. Yourself, but take us a little bit no, deeper. Well, no, I'm You're the just saying, a kid might want some sneakers. His mother might give him sneakers, or he might inherit some sneakers. But the kid really wants those $300 pair of Michael Jordan's Air, Air Jordan. And he'll yeah, do it's so hard for me. It's so hard for me to hear this conversation, let alone participate to it, because we talking about sneakers. But I know the story is so much bigger. I know you the conversation is so much broader. It's, it's, it's yeah, just it's, pain to think about sneakers. No, but I'm just using that symbolic. I hate you know, I'm, just, I'm just it's symbolic of what the haves and the have-nots. It's, it's really what the, these McKinsey kids are saying about wealth disparity. It's those girls who, even though they were forced to wear uniforms in the school, wore the better sweater. Exactly. And it was important to them. And you protected the equality or the egalitarian by making them all wear uniforms. And I'm just saying, I, you know, I, I'm a Pollyannish too, because I'm saying maybe maybe if we created all these companies and they were hiring a lot of kids, I'm not going to be Pollyanna saying, you're not going to have drugs, you're not going to have drugs. But maybe we could have a higher percentage of those kids who are part of that industry should be part of your industry or be when a part you see of the other. Create, when you see the creativity, when you see the nimbleness, when you see the agility and the passion, when you see the skills, the talent, 
Exactly. And it takes to survive on the street to exactly. be able to move that into a boardroom or into a science lab. Exactly. I think you're suggesting then people may go, but they ain't going to do that for McDonald's at minimum wage. Right. I think I, and, and I ain't hating on McDonald's either. I think right. that's what you're saying. And, and we should not be relegated only to that. I think McDonald's has said that. McDonald's has a program for scholarships, getting their yes. kids in there. God bless them. I knew the former president. They see those president. jobs as, as a pathway, as a path. not as a well, end. There you go. With all due respect, McDonald's has done that. It's been a, McDonald's a great company. I talk about in the sense of they created more black millionaires, almost any company in America. I'd love them to do business with me. Well, call me up. I'll talk to you. I'll call you up on that because after all, <laughs> you and I still, hey, look, we're out here speaking memories, but we still on our hustle for the future. We on the hustle. Yeah. <laughs> hey, 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 I got to do this, though. We got so much to do, and I, 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 just, I, just, I just treasure the time with you. We got, I got to do this, though. Everywhere my organization, I speak with people. I speak with them and ask them at some point in our relationship, to read the poem by Rayet Kipling, If. Mm -hmm. Now, I ask them to make it gender appropriate as they feel it important, but please don't le lose the study in the poem, If. Let me ask you in the spirit of Rayet Kipling, if you could relive any one period in your life around the idea of changing of trajectory or being able to create a different or broader outcome, not disrespecting where you've done, where would that be if? That's a great question. And I, I they tell you, some of my mentors say, you never kind of look back on what you didn't do. You just be happy where you are. But if I think, I kind of allude to it in the book. When I was leaving McKinsey, Bingo. If, if, if I'd had taken a different route, who knows where I'd be? Mm -hmm. Because I was the only black. Mm -hmm. I had done well there. McKinsey wasn't, you know, it was a Republican, you know, Eastern Ivy League kind of thing with contacts. And many of my classmates at McKinsey, like Lou Gershner, he was in my class. Mm -hmm. became the head of IBM and American Express. I think I could have really been a captain of industry. Yeah. You could have been a captain of industry is not at all fascinating to me. It would be fascinating to America and to our story. It wouldn't be fascinating to me. Here's where I thought you were going to go. And when I bingo you on leaving McKinsey, if you trajectory made a trajectory change there, you said earlier in our conversation that while we've had great civil rights leaders, we didn't understand business. I think you could have been our president. And that's why I brought that up. And when you spoke about the commitments you've made to yourself and number seven, which we have to revisit very, mm -hmm. uh, very importantly, I think that because one of the things that David said in the conversation, the fireside chat I mentioned earlier, where he spoke to the spiritual awareness and, and, and uh, repentance around America's great sin of slavery and what's happened since then. And he does as well in that conversation, and I'll share it with you, uh, talk about how that happened. What he does beautifully is Professor, he talks about the impact of slavery and, uh, and, and the world's uh, view on Black growing up in the community. Then he talks about the impact of his family having moved to England and the impact in the UK that they had, and then coming to America, the impact. Another thing he did that reminded me of some things you taught, he talked about having played a slave who asked Lincoln, when will they get the vote? And then playing Dr. King, King. projected a hundred years later in history, asking Lyndon Johnson, when will we get the vote? And so he says a hundred years span and he am playing 
these people in blockbuster movies uh, and we're still asking the question. And so he's hopeful for his children. And I remember you talking about that, about us asking these same questions. And so when I asked you the if question, I thought immediately, and this is just my own fantasy about you, what of many, may I say, um, is that you could, I think, have been the president. I'm not suggesting you can't now, but I do think you could have been a president as well. And that's why I say we can talk about first or we can name those who did, but until yeah. we've too many to name, we have not begun. We've only platformed. Does that make sense? Oh, I know. And to be honest, and I can only be honest with you, the thought of running for office entered my mind. And I was the chairman of the Chicago Public Library System under Harold Washington. Yes. And they were planning for me to run for mayor to replace Harold. But I said, I really worship my time to do what I want to do. And when you're the mayor, you have no time. You have no freedom. You're just going from crisis to crisis. And I was happy enough, you know, when I said the fame fortune, I, I had enough the fortune and the fame was in my own thing. So I was happy on where I was and where I wanted to continue to work. That was in 1985, because I was right around, that was the same time as Ford. I did Ford the same time I did Harold Washington. Well, I'm grateful that you didn't change that trajectory because I wouldn't know you the way I do, <laughs> sure. So, and so many companies, not, may I say, not just black businesses, but diverse businesses, as well as corporations, and as well as America, are very blessed for what you did, because the changes that you've made, the impact you've made, whether it ever has your name on it, and most of it doesn't, certainly has made America better. So I'm grateful that you didn't change. It was a fun fantasy moment, though, to see where you would land it. We landed yeah. at the same spot, but we were thinking about different paths. Yeah. Okay. And when I, when I say a capital industry, I'm talking about being an entrepreneur, not somebody in corporate America. I've mm -hmm. always believed in being an entrepreneur. Well, you certainly built enough of them, including this one. Let's do our four for four. So if you could have dinner, this is the real if, if you could have dinner and invite anyone from any point in history you'd like to your dinner table, who would be seated beside you? What four people would be seated around your table? Bobby Kennedy. Mm -hmm. You want Bobby back again? He left too early, huh? He left too early. He was very young. He was very, very young. Maynard Jackson. Mm -hmm. Maynard will always be one of my favorite people. And he got punished for being the iconic leader that he was in his first two terms in Atlanta. Most people don't realize that. Um, and I had the opportunity, I just didn't take advantage when I said it, to really be at the table with Warren Buffett. Because, you know, Warren's had an interest, and he's been on the board with me, but, you know, without a board, you know how you keep talking to board. But Warren is an interesting guy. He just bought Dominion, didn't he? Bought in Dominion. Yeah. Just bought it for three, I don't know how many billions. Yeah, he did. And you know who's now on his board, don't you? Ken Chenault. Ooh, okay. He left Microsoft, I think he left, yeah, he left Microsoft to go on Warren Buffett. And probably Ken Chenault. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Ken Chenault. Mm-hmm. An yeah. elegant, elegant man who has an ability to be as down to earth in his elegance as anybody I've seen. Yeah. And uh, those are the four. Let me um, see, who did you get? So did you add Ken Chenault to that? Yeah. Okay, throw some ladies at the table. That's what I was just thinking. You know, because there's so much, you know, I, I just thought about this. I said it's going to seem too self-serving. But you and Harriet, I mean, both of you. You mean Harriet Michelle. 
Yeah, who just had her birthday yesterday. Oh, no, uh-uh. You're going to turn that dinner up like that. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> look, look, if you put Harriet and me in there together, oh, my I God. No. That's why I was smiling. I said I wouldn't be able to say anything between you two oh sisters. Oh, my God. One of my greatest sheroes of all time. Don't put yeah, each she's, other together. Oh, you that's Harriet and I get together. Um, you know how we are. But uh, I thought you were going to say Shirley Chisholm or... <laughs> No, Harry Michelle. I mean, she's Harriet another giant. How about Harriet Tubman? <laughs> no, Harry Michelle and you, you two, I just, I mean, it's close. I mean, but I tell you what, if you, have, if you have Harriet Michelle at the table, I sure want to be there. I tell you that. I want to be there. I love that lady. I love her. You know, and we laugh, we joke. We've been to Africa. She just had a birthday. We're aging together. It's just, you know, it, it just brings so much joy. Both of them. Gorgeous just inside and out. Gorgeous inside and out. In it, inside and out. And, you know, poor little Steve Sims, he just said a note. Okay, but, second four. What are the four books that if you could only keep for the rest of your life to read, what would those four be? This might shock you. Think and Grow Rich. Changed my life. Changed my life. Mine too. Really? Yeah. Do you know in Africa, this is a sidebar, I read that book in Africa. You know, I was 31, 32, something like that. And the man said, write a, a, a life plan where you want to be at 55. And, and, and really talking about wealth, net worth, you know, impact on the community, physically. And I came across what I wrote in Tanzania. In 1972, I'd achieved every one of those goals, yes, except, yes, except yes. one. Except yes. one. I didn't have three kids. I, I really wish I'd had three kids. That's the only thing. Mm -hmm. Every one of those goals I did. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, you know, it's funny because when my husband and I married, uh, we talked and we dreamed out loud before we did marry. One of the things that I dreamed of was having my own Walton clan. Like, I wanted eight kids. My mom and dad had 11. One mom, one dad. Uh, but I wanted eight after I gave birth that first time. <laughs> and I did a home birth. I did a home birth, right? I was like, whoa, this man thinks he has married him in Amazon. I can't do this. I can't do this. Um, and I prayed to Brett, our second child, to come easy. He didn't necessarily come easy, but he came with less pain than I recalled Kay to come with. And I am grateful for the two, but I closed shop. <laughs> I closed shop. Close I didn't get my eight when I wrote down mine. Either. Uh, okay, so, so uh, your books. It had a profound impact to me. Was the the saga of the black soldiers in the Second World War? I will read that. I will read it. You should read that. It, it really, what they went through, what they did, how, how brilliant they were. It, it's really, it makes you think about, you know? Uh, isn't there a conversation now about in renaming the Redskins team football club yeah. in D.C. to call them the Red Tails? Yes, it is. It, I saw it on the page. Uh, yeah, they had these different, uh, they've already got the photographs of what it would look like. The logo. Yeah. The logo. They're already side draft, and they're talking about changing so 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 since you're so bad and you just get in trouble all over the place anyway, uh, let me ask you, what do you think about renaming the Redskins? I mean, that may not be your team, but you are a fan of the sport. Yeah, I think Snyder should have done a long time ago. I really, I really do. And how do you and feel about the name of the Redskins versus the Washington Club? What, what do you mean Washington Club? Is that what they're talking just, about? Just a, just a different name. I think they should. I mean, I like, think you like you like the red tails for the name. Yeah, I like the red tails. I think it would send a message. I think it's very it's very interesting that the coach who is Hispanic, you know, he's one of few two Hispanic coaches in the history of the NFL, is working with the president to change the name. I think that would be a tremendous. You know, we're looking at DC. DC is going to change. Uh, one way or another, it's going to change. Well, they do have a they do they do have a, a new carpet along the street, don't they? Yes, they do. Didn't, didn't they paint a new carpet along the street? Black lives live, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I tell you one thing, uh, Red Tails is an elegant name, and it can have a very, very classy logo, can it? Yeah, I saw it. Yeah, it's beautiful. You know, and, you know, it, you know, you know, and I, I think that there are other books. Let me try to think of some more books. Your fourth book. Your fourth book. I got, I'm looking at all these books. They really have tremendous impact on me. You know, I think the other thing, you know, because I like business, but I think The Game Changer was a book that educated me. Mm -hmm. You know, I, you, you, you tell by my conversations, I have this real desire to learn about things that people don't want you to know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's intriguing, not to say I'm going to do the things that they suggest, but at least I want to know how America works, how corporations work, how community works. And I still got to be myself, how I function and all, but I got to know. Well, we're going on to three for four, and we got four for four. Here's three for four. What are the four songs or artists you're listening to these days, and why? Well, one is a selfish reason is John Legend. I, I, I was really, I was really hoping you would say that. Couldn't <laughs> imagine you not. And we could hardly wait to get to three for four. So tell us why. Because this was one of these young guys that I saw. And he was just the nicest kid. He was, he was at BCG when he was just right out of University of Pennsylvania. He was a good Christian young guy. Played the piano in the spare time. He, won he was torn between having you know, a career in consulting or being a talent. And it was one of those kind of conversations I had with him, I had with you. Yep. And I said, do whatever you feel you want to do. Whatever you do, I will support you. So if you want to stay in BCG, I will support you. If you want to go out, I'll be out there with those demos trying to get you a contract with Sony or somebody else. We will go to clubs. And that's how we started our relationship. You called, you called LA deep for him, didn't you? Yep. Yeah. And I was so, people thought I was emotional and in tears at the ELC dinner, which you mentioned, but people don't know what that stands for. Um, and you can tell us all, but I was in tears when they honored you that night, all dressed up, thought I was looking good. You were. I, look, put on some eye makeup and stuff, but <laughs> it special for you, and it just all went... <laughs> But I wasn't crying for his music, although often I do, often I do for the beauty of it. I was crying because of the beauty of him leaving a tour to come back to honor you on your special night. Yeah, and uh, we were on a on a talk about five months ago, and it was an interview. This kid interviewed us together. It was a big Hollywood thing, you know. And he said it then, and he repeats it. He said, well, you know, my life wouldn't have been the same if that had been for the Jim Lowry, and I love him. Mm -hmm. I mean, he said love. I mean, he always mm -hmm. says love when it comes to me. He said it that night as his, as his wife and daughter waited for him to perform. I think they flew in to do the concert and flew right back to Europe, didn't they? Yeah. That same night to honor you. I mean, he, you have an eye for talent. You have a heart for love. And I am just really grateful that, hey, look, I'm in the company of John Legend. Get named. <laughs> they were Janice Wright, how well did John Legend have in common? They both got lifted by James Lowry. <laughs> you you helped us in our come up. So thank you. No, but, and you're so, so, both of you are so great. And you're such a model for so many people. So that's yeah. one artist. That could be all four as far as I'm concerned. But if you have three more, give them to us. Well, you know, you're talking about just enjoying music. I still love Maxwell. Yeah. I just, I just love Maxwell. You like it smooth and easy. I like smooth and easy. 
Well, I mean, but, you live such a you live such a busy, heavily brainy life. I, I, I get where you're coming from because I tell people, listen to the music that takes you want, where you want to go. And sometimes you want to go into that special private yeah. place, huh? Put, put that your phone's on, you get on that plane. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I guess, you know, I would always love Marvin Gaye. Oh, yeah. Like, could, could you think of anything more relevant than his What's Going On album right now? That's in my book. Well, I'll tell you something else that I've been, I've been listening to recently. Taking us back to the city. By the way, your book is it, it hits it all. You right. It, it hits it all. But go ahead, please, Professor. Yes. Jerry Butler and Impressions, and really Curtis Murfield. When you talk about the 60s, it, and Curtis, Curtis Murfield was one of the he, he was ahead of his time talking about, you know, the junkies. I mean, think about some of keep on pushing all those. And I started listening to lyrics again. I said, Fred is dead. Fred is dead. Come on now. Mm -hmm. we're, getting, we're getting on up. Most people just know him for people getting ready. They don't even remember the impressions. Gypsy woman, come mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. Now I'm giving you a little footnote in, in history, getting back to, we talk about second and third generations. The original lead singer was Jerry Butler. Mm -hmm. You remember My Precious Love? Yeah, for it's your Jerry precious love. Precious Love and the Impression. Yes. And then, then he decided to go into politics later. He became first a single artist. Then he, he just retired last year as a county commissioner for the city of Chicago. Guess who replaced him? Who? My nephew, the son I never had. Wow. He's a young guy who has 55 lawyers in his law firm. He's a managing partner, and he felt he had to give back. And now he's a county commissioner, and he might be the next mayor or more. Wow. wow. Stay continue. Stay, stay tuned. But he replaced oh, 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 as they say, As they say, as they say <laughs> these days, put a pin in it. Put a pin on it. He is, he's got the best of his father and me. He's great. Well, look, we sure will put a pin in it because I'm going to be talking with you again. We've got so much to share. We got to do four for four, and we've done three for four. Okay. Uh, given that you added Curtis Mayfield. By the way, he is one of the most incredible artists. I agree with you. Um, See, Nina Simone. Nina Simone. Singing which one? Because that lady has such a repertoire. Do you have a favorite Nina Simone song? Mississippi Goddamn. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yesterday, so as Sibling Sunday, yep. yesterday, uh, you everybody, had to, like Every, yeah. everybody had to bring the song. Everybody had to bring the song to the table that yeah. best expressed where they'd been for the week. And my sister Trish did Nina Simone's version of Young, Gifted, and Black, mm -hmm. even though she had just finished watching the BET Awards with Jennifer Hudson doing the Aretha Franklin homage. But she said, I somehow, with both of these incredible artists, Aretha Franklin and Jennifer Hutt Hudson, she said, somehow, I hear young, gifted, and black through Nina Simone's voice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to four for four, all right? What are the four best pieces of advice you've ever been given that you care to share with us right now? This brings us home, Professor Lowry. One, don't look back. Do the best you can, but don't look back. You can't spend all your life wondering what you should have done, how you should have done it. See, I know I'll get you back in the Bible. You're preaching about <laughs> Lot's wife. <laughs> See, that's it. Well, and then I'm going to really get back to the Bible because I practice what I preach. I don't want anybody doing, you know, do unto others you want them to do unto you. And that's where I've lived. You know, I've always wanted to be somebody and do the right things for others. That's your number two? That's my number two. Okay. Um, and then I think the third one is always reach as high as you can. And even if you don't reach your highest goal, you're going to be that much more successful because you had the vision to reach by. And it keeps your back straight, doesn't it? It keeps you back straight. You keep going. You're going to keep doing. 
And at my age, it gets you up in the morning that you got stuff to do. I mean, I'm, I've been self-quarantined. I've been doing that much. I'm writing, you know, because I know where I want to go. You know, I have a goal. I still have goals. I still have goals. And I hope the good Lord keeps me around here long. And that, every time I tell people my age and stuff like that, they say, no. I said, yeah, I got to try and survive. Oh, you're going to live a long time. You're going to live. And then, then sometimes they'll, they'll get really honest and say, oh, we need you longer than this. Well, That's you what know what? Maybe this quarantine is helping you because you are looking very vibrant and lovely and, 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 and um, you've always been so quick with it. We can't do anything about your brain. But, but seeing you, you just look like a bottle of health. Somebody ought to put a stopper on you and pour you out in drops. And you know, I wrote that whole book by memory. Wow. I didn't have any, I didn't have any ghost writers. I just listed my whole life and just started writing for each one of those. And, and the highest compliment I get on the book is people say, that's your voice. We can't know wait. that it's you. Can't, can't wait for part two because you're writing a lot more script. You got some receipts. <laughs> you definitely got receipts. Yeah. I got, I got to do that. What's number four advice? Bring us home with it. You know, it's my, I'll always reach back and help people behind you. You know, help those behind you. That's that's always a, you know, it's my my mantra. That's why I guess I'm a change agent. This 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 conversation is just the dream come true. I also pray it's just one in a series. I'm convinced we need to just sit down and read your book chapter by chapter and talk it out and just push it out there. Um, I had so many questions as I was reading it that I wanted to ask you. She who thinks she knows you well. I had so many questions I just wanted to ask you as I read through it. With all the strength of my years, I can't thank you enough for the strength you've given to my family by giving to me. I love you in so many ways, and I'm so grateful for the conversation that you've given me today. That is just now a chance for people to know how I live and, and bloom under your tutelage, under your friendship. I pray I honor you as I move forward in my life. Um, there's so many more things for us to talk about. Is there anything else you want to add today before I... Yeah. No, I just think, you know, I feel obviously the same way you do. And I just think there's two people who really believe in many of the same things. That somehow between your busy schedule and my busy schedule, we just have to make it happen. Because I think by sharing knowledge, wisdom, networks, insights, you know, we can make the world better. So anytime you call me, anytime you reach out, and I give your sister a hard time. I said, she don't love me no more. So tell her that, you know, make sure it happens, okay? She's somewhere listening right now. And I, I, know. Know, I know she's in check, okay? You put her in check on I that. I am. I'm gonna talk, I call her every now and then. She don't love me no more. I got to see Janet. Says, well, she's busy. I said, so am I. So <laughs> <laughs> that's what I tell her. So am I. I said, so we got never to too busy for you. Never. What did Luther say? Never too much. Never too much. Never too much going on for you. Love you from yeah. my heart. Love you. I'm so proud of you. I love you so much. So, Professor, from my heart to your home, God bless, and I will talk with you again. Promise. On this podcast. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>